Welcome to Biomechanics. As you know, Biomechanics is at the interface of mechanics and biology, which are both very large fields of study. So in this course on tissue mechanics, we will narrow our attention to the interface between continuum mechanics and physiology, especially human physiology. This is a very natural and synergistic partnership. Let's consider on the left side the elements of every boundary value problem in continuum mechanics. There are key parallels to the major topics of study in physiology. The first thing we need in continuum mechanics is the geometry and structure of the body of interest. And the first thing we do in physiology is explore the functional anatomy and morphology of the tissue and organ of interest. Next in continuum mechanics, we need the boundary conditions and physiology is directly concerned with how tissues and organs respond to changes in their environment and the external stimuli that they experience. In continuum mechanics, we have the conservation laws. And in physiology, we rely on critical biological principles such as homeostasis. Conservation of mass is a frequently invoked concept in physiology, especially in considering processes like mass transport, flow and growth. Fick's law, for example, is a version of mass conservation that was first derived for physiological mass transport. William Harvey actually predicted the existence of blood circulation in 1628, more than 30 years before Marcello Malpighi actually saw the capillaries and the blood flowing in them in the frog lung in 1661. Conservation of energy is directly related to energy metabolism and is a major topic in physiology. Conservation of momentum is used to understand motion, flow, and equilibrium of fluid and solid tissues in physiological systems. For example, Poisseur, for whom the famous law of laminar tube flow was named, was a physiologist who performed experiments on tube flow in 1838 and then subsequently did the analysis in 1840 and published the work in 1846. And finally, in continuum mechanics, we have the constitutive equations which describe the relationship between the structure of a material and its mechanical properties. And structure function relations are a key objective and goal of physiologists to understand the relationship between the structure and the function of cells and tissues in organs. And the constitutive equation, therefore, is a representation of mechanical structure function relations. So in summary, we can say that continuum mechanics provides a mathematical framework for integrating the structure of the cell and tissue into the mechanical function of the whole organ. Biomechanics relies not only on the theories of mechanics, but on the experimental traditions of biology. To formulate our continuum mechanics model, we need to measure inputs such as the geometry, boundary conditions, and material properties. Usually this is done in vitro. This also often requires novel engineering designs of new test systems. To implement and solve the model requires numerical methods and computing. And then to test the model, we validate the model outputs by measuring predicted responses in living systems, often in vivo. Usually this then requires us to revise the model, make more measurements, implement the, the new model, and test the outputs again. Once we've repeated this cycle and we've validated the model, we can start to apply it to clinical and bioengineering problems, such as medical device design or analysis of clinical data. Let's examine an example of this interplay between theory and experiment by looking at the mechanics of the heart. In order to formulate our continuum mechanics model of the heart, we'll need to measure inputs to the model, including the anatomy and microstructure, the mechanical properties of the tissue, and the mechanical properties of the cells. We require computational techniques such as numerical analysis, visualization, and data analysis to implement and solve the model. And then in order to test the model predictions, we need to validate the results using physiological measurements in vivo, uh, such as uh, in a disease model of the ischemic heart. Finally, when the model is sufficiently validated, we will look at examples of applying these approaches to clinical and biomedical engineering design problems, such as cardiac imaging analysis, 
and medical device design. Let's look first at the anatomy and microstructure. So here we see some of the key features of the anatomy of the heart that we may need to incorporate in our analysis. We see the right ventricle and the left ventricle, the right atrium and the left atrium, superior vena cava, aorta, and pulmonary artery. The tricuspid valve is between the right atrium and the right ventricle, and the pulmonic valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. Oxygenated blood from the lungs returns via the pulmonary veins to the left atrium and then goes into the left ventricle via the mitral valve. It's ejected into the aorta through the aortic valve, which you can't see here. Some important features of the anatomy of the heart wall include the fact that the left ventricle is significantly thicker than the right ventricle because it pumps against the substantially higher pressures of the systemic circulation. And the papillary muscles and chordae tendinae contract during systole to keep the valves closed as the ventricular pressure rises. These are important features, but particularly important in the mechanics of the heart wall are the microstructural properties of the heart tissue. Here we see a reconstruction from diffusion tensor magnetic resonance imaging of the orientations of the muscle fibers within the ventricular walls and the layers that the fibers are bundled into by the extracellular matrix. You can see on this close-up that on the outside of the ventricle, the muscle fibers have an orientation that's rotated about 60 degrees clockwise from circumferential. And as we move through the wall, that angle gradually gets smaller until we reach the middle of the wall, where now the mid-wall fibers are approximately circumferential. And as we keep going, now the fibers take on an increasingly counterclockwise angle, becoming almost vertical near the inner surface of the wall. In addition, the planes of these little glyphs show the planes of the laminae that the extracellular matrix organizes the muscle fibers into. And you can see that the orientation of those uh, laminar sheets also changes through the thickness of the ventricular walls. So these are additional important details that determine the mechanical properties of the heart wall and how the contraction of the muscle fibers translates into the mechanics of the whole ventricle. Next, let's look at an example of tissue mechanical properties. The cardiac muscle cells are bundled together by a collagen extracellular matrix shown here with these fine black lines and this thicker dark line, as well as these interconnections between cells and this fine network of matrix around each cell. Below we see a sketch of what the muscle tissue looks like in a mouse harboring a gene mutation associated with the human disease, osteogenesis imperfecta. Osteogenesis imperfecta is associated with the deficiency of type 1 collagen, the commonest collagen in the body, and brittle bones. The osteogenesis imperfecta mouse has much less collagen in its extracellular matrix. So to understand what the contribution of type 1 collagen is to the mechanics of the muscle, we can do stress-strain testing in the wild-type normal mouse and in the mutant osteogenesis imperfecta mouse. And you can see that compared with the wild-type mouse in blue, the osteogenesis imperfecta mouse in red has strains that are about 40% larger uh, for a given stress, suggesting that type 1 collagen may be contributing up to 40% of the stiffness of cardiac muscle in the normal mouse at rest. We also, in cardiac muscle, need to understand the cellular properties that give rise to dynamic muscle contraction. Heart cells are muscle cells, and they are called muscle fibers after skeletal muscle cells. However, unlike skeletal muscle cells, they're not really fibers at all. You can see from this picture that a cardiac myocyte or myofiber is shaped more like a brick or rod. They're connected end to end to create a fibrous structure, but the cells themselves are not fibers. The striations are about two microns apart and represent the repeating pattern of contractile filaments. We can measure forces in a single cardiac muscle cell by attaching a force transducer to one end and a length controller to the other end. Here we can see that the single cell at close to slack length with a striation spacing of about two microns has a rest force and when it's stimulated to contract it develops a tension of about one micronewton. Then after the cell is stretched from a sarcomere length of 2 microns to 2.15 microns, so about a 7.5% stretch, 
you can see the resting tension goes up a little bit, but the developed tension doubles or more than doubles. And this is called the Frank Starling mechanism. Keeping the muscle at this new longer length and waiting for a few minutes, you can see that the tension continues to rise so that after three and a half minutes now, compared with the original tension, the developed contractile tension is three times or more higher than it was originally. This is known as the ANREP effect. So these are all important properties that we would need to include in a model that takes into account the mechanics of cardiac muscle contraction in the heart. To solve the continuum mechanics model that takes into account the complex geometry and fiber architecture and nonlinear mechanical properties and dynamic contractile properties, we need to use computational methods. This is an example of a finite element model of the heart showing the right ventricle, the left ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, pulmonary artery and aorta. The complex geometry is divided up into smaller, simpler shapes to facilitate the analysis on a computer. Once we've run the model, we need to test the outputs of the model by comparing them with quantities that we can measure, preferably in vivo in an intact beating heart. Cardiac ischemia occurs when one or more coronary arteries becomes blocked and the blood supply to a region of the heart wall is cut off. Almost immediately, contraction ceases because the cardiac muscle cells depend critically on oxidative phosphorylation to generate the energy that they require for the work of contraction. Cardiologists use measurements of abnormal wall motion during systole to estimate the size and location of the ischemic area. Here we see an experiment where metal radiopaque markers have been attached to the outside surface of the heart and recorded at high speed as the heart wall contracts. From this, strains on the surface of the heart can be calculated before and after a coronary artery was ligated, causing this region here to become ischemic. Here you can see the strains during systole on the surface of the heart, where the black line here shows the boundary between the ischemic area that has no blood flow and the area of normal blood flow. The blue color represents the fact that during systole, the tissue is shortening the red colors show that in the ischemic area, the tissue is actually lengthening during systole. That's because the cells in this area don't have the energy supply to contract. Meanwhile, as the pressure goes up while the rest of the wall contracts, this tissue gets stretched. Interestingly, we see that even outside the boundary of the ischemic area where the blood flow is normal, the mechanics remain abnormal for some distance. So in this area outside the ischemic zone, the strains are still positive or zero. So this shows an in mechanical interaction between the positive strains in the stretching ischemic region and the negative strains in the shortening non-ischemic region. It suggests that using abnormalities of wall motion to estimate the size of the ischemic area may actually overestimate the area of reduced blood flow. But it also shows that a reduction in blood flow to an area of the heart wall can impact the mechanical function of a larger region of the wall. Once we've tested our model, revised it, refined it, and satisfied ourselves that the results are accurate enough, we can start to use the predictions of the model for other purposes. Now keep in mind that not everything that we compute with the model might be able to be measured. We can, for example, measure the strain, but we can't easily measure the stress in the heart wall. So we can use measurements of strain to test the model, and then if the measurements of strain agree with the model, then we can deduce that the predicted stresses and quantities derived from the stresses, such as the regional work, may be reliable. Now, once we've validated the model for a certain range of conditions and problem, we can apply it to medical and bioengineering problems, such as the development of image analysis approaches for cardiac imaging or the design of new medical devices for cardiac procedures. This is a magnetic resonance image of a human heart. One method in magnetic resonance imaging is called magnetic resonance tagging, and it allows these tag lines, these, this grid, to be laid down in the image at a certain phase of the cardiac cycle, such as end diastole. 
These regions of altered magnetization produced by the MR scanner persist in the tissue long enough that as the heart wall moves, the motion of the tag lines can be used to measure the motion of the heart wall. So unlike the previous example, where the experimenters had to suture metal markers on the heart wall so they'd be visible in the x-ray, here the markers can be added non-invasively using the magnetic resonance scanner. And you can see that by ancestrally, the left ventricular wall has changed shape. The lines have moved and bent. The grid that was originally in the cavity has washed away because the blood's been ejected. And doing this at multiple planes and in multiple axes allows a fully three-dimensional distribution of the shape change and strain in the heart wall to be computed. Here we see a model of that shape change reconstructed from the MR tagging images in this patient. And what we see is that between end diastole shown in cyan and end systole shown in black, the shape change is actually very small. And the left ventricle itself is in fact highly enlarged compared with normal. This is because this patient is in end stage heart failure and has a very low ejection fraction. So the strains in the wall of this patient during systole were abnormally small. Biomechanics has also been useful in the development of analysis methods for other cardiac imaging modalities such as ultrasound. Biomechanics is also vital in the design of a large number of medical devices, such as an angioplasty catheter seen here. The balloon angioplasty catheter is advanced through the arterial system to the coronary artery to the location of an atherosclerotic plaque that causes a blockage or stenosis. And then the balloon is inflated to expand the vessel and restore the blood flow to the heart wall. Unfortunately, after some time, the stenosis tends to return. So to prevent that, usually a stent is placed to keep the vessel open after the angioplasty procedure is performed. There are many other devices that involve biomechanical design used in the heart and cardiovascular system, such as replacement heart valves, vascular stents, tissue engineered coronary bypass grafts, surgical techniques and devices, clinical imaging hardware and software, pacemaker leads, and numerous other examples, including those that go beyond the heart, such as orthopedic implants, wheelchairs, crash helmets, airbags, infusion pumps, athletic shoes, and many more. So we will see many examples of biomechanics and bioengineering design during this quarter. So now that we've seen examples of this critical interaction between experimental and physiological measurement, theory, computation, and design in biomechanics, let's review some of the key ideas from continuum mechanics that we've learned about last quarter. The elements of a boundary value problem in continuum mechanics consist of the geometry and structure of the body or domain of interest, the boundary conditions, the governing equations that include conservation laws, including conservation of mass. There are both Eulerian and Lagrangian forms of these, but we won't do the Eulerian form until later. Conservation of momentum, both linear and angular. And conservation of energy that we'll learn about this quarter. Finally, there are the constitutive equations that describe the mechanical properties of the particular material or tissue of interest. So let's start by reviewing the conservation laws. The Lagrangian version of conservation of mass states that the mass delta m, which is rho naught delta big V, of the material in the initial material volume element, delta big V, remains constant as the element deforms to volume delta little v with density rho, and that this must hold everywhere, i.e. for an arbitrarily small delta v. So writing this in integral form, we have that the volume integral of rho naught with respect to big V must equal the volume integral of rho with respect to little v. Now substituting 
In terms of the undeformed and deformed coordinates, we have that the volume integral of rho naught d big x1, d big x2, d big x3 must equal the volume integral of rho integrated with respect to little x1, little x2, and little x3. And using a change of variables, this gives us the volume integral of rho times the determinant of del little xi del big xr integrated with respect to big x1, big x2, and big x3. This quantity here is the deformation gradient tensor. Del xi, del xr are components of the deformation gradient tensor. And these vertical lines represent that this is the determinant of the deformation gradient tensor. So this is a Jacobian that converts integration with respect to deformed coordinates, little x1, 2, and 3, to integration with respect to undeformed coordinates, big x1, 2, and 3. Now, making use of the fact that this expression must hold for any arbitrary volume or region, then it must in general be true for every point, and therefore what's inside the integrand must itself be satisfied. In other words, rho naught divided by rho must equal d little v over d big v, which must equal the determinant of del xi, del xr, which is the determinant of f, the deformation gradient tensor. Since the determinant of the rotation tensor is 1, and f equals r times u, the determinant of f equals the determinant of u, the right stretch tensor, which is the product of the principal stretch ratios lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. And for the special case of an incompressible solid, where the deformed density rho equals the undeformed density rho naught, we get the kinematic incompressibility constraint that the determinant of f must equal 1. So all this says is that the ratio of the undeformed to deformed density must equal the ratio of the deformed volume to the undeformed volume, because the product of the undeformed density times the undeformed volume must equal the product of the deformed density times the deformed volume. This volume ratio, in turn, as we've seen before, is just the determinant of the deformation gradient tensor. So that's the Lagrangian form of conservation of mass. Conservation of linear momentum states that the rate of change of linear momentum of the particles that instantaneously lie within a fixed spatial region R equals the resultant of the body forces B measured per unit mass acting on the particles in R plus the resultant of the surface traction Tn acting on the surface of R. So this gives us that the time rate of change ddt of the volume integral of the momentum per unit volume, so the mass per unit volume times the velocity, must equal the volume integral of the body force per unit mass times the mass per unit volume, which is therefore the body force per unit volume integrated over the volume, plus the integral of the surface tractions over the surface. So rate of change of momentum equals body forces plus surface forces. And applying the divergence theorem and using the argument again that this must be true for any arbitrary region R and so therefore what's inside the integral must itself be satisfied leads us to the conservation of linear momentum being rho dv dt where dv dt is the acceleration equals the divergence of the stress tensor which is the surface forces plus rho times b which are the body forces and writing this in index notation and expanding the material derivative so that we get the transient acceleration and the convective acceleration, we get that rho del vi del t, the transient inertial forces, plus rho vk del vi del xk, the convective inertial forces, equals del tji del xj, the surface forces, plus rho bi, the body forces. Conservation of angular momentum states that the rate of change of angular momentum of the particles that instantaneously lie within a fixed spatial region R equals the resultant couple about the origin of the body forces B per unit mass acting on the particles in R plus the resultant couple of the surface tractions Tn acting on the surface S. Subject to the assumption that there are no distributed body or surface couples, 
acting on the material in the region. This law leads simply to the same result that we derived for the stress tensor when we considered the stress in equilibrium, namely that the stress is symmetric for T equals T transpose or Tij equals Tji. We will derive formally the conservation of energy later this quarter, but it states that the rate of change of kinetic energy plus internal energy in the region R equals the rate at which mechanical work is done by the body forces and surface tractions acting on the region, plus the rate at which heat enters the region across its surface S. So mathematically, this looks like this. This is the rate of change of the kinetic energy, mass times V dot V per unit volume integrated over the volume, plus the internal energy, which is a internal property of the material, which is internal energy per unit mass times mass per unit volume integrated over the volume, is equal to the work done by the body forces. So this is the body forces per unit mass times mass per unit volume gives us body force per unit volume. Times velocity gives us rate of work integrated over the volume plus Integrated over the surface, the tr surface traction forces times the velocities, which is the rate of work done by the surface tractions, minus the heat flux vector dotted with the unit outward normal to the surface integrated across the surface, which is the rate of heat leaving the region, and therefore minus rate of heat leaving is the rate at which heat enters the region. And with some manipulation, as we'll see later, this reduces to rho times the rate of change of internal energy is equal to the rate of work done by the stresses, which turns out to be trace of T dot D, where D is the rate of deformation tensor, minus the divergence of the heat flux vector, or Tji times del Vi del Xj minus del Qi del Xi in index notation, where E is the internal energy density, the internal energy per unit mass of the material itself, and Q is the heat flux vector. So the conservation law is universal for all materials. The constitutive law is specific for particular materials and is what makes biomechanics interesting. So the conservation laws of continuum mechanics are universal and independent of the material as long as the continuum assumption is appropriate. The constitutive law describes the property of the particular material of interest. The constitutive law describes the mechanical properties of a material which depend on its constituents. Constitutive law is a mathematical relationship for stress as a function of kinematic quantities such as strain, or in the case of fluid strain rate. The constitutive law is an idealization and an approximation. The validity of the idealization depends not only on the material, but also under the mechanical conditions in which the material is being subjected. Typically, the constitutive law must be determined by experiment. But it's constrained by thermodynamic and other physical conditions such as conservation of mass and energy. It should also be derived by taking into consideration the microstructure of the material. In this course, we will focus on solid tissues, and the most common and important class of constitutive law for solid tissues is known as elasticity. In an elastic solid, the stress depends only on the strain, so Tij is only a function of epsilon kL, the strain. Elastic solids return to a unique natural state when the loads are removed. The strain in the constitutive law is referred to this stress-free unloaded state, so that when the strain is zero, the stress in the constitutive law will also be zero. The work done during loading of an elastic solid is stored as potential energy without dissipation in other words, it's a thermodynamically reversible process, that of loading and unloading an elastic material. 
An example of an elastic material, the simplest example, is an isotropic Hookean linear elastic solid in which the relationship between the stress and the strain is linear. For example, in a linearly elastic Hookean solid, the tensile stress is linearly proportional to the tensile strain, and the slope of that linear stress-strain relationship is called E, the Young's modulus. In a nonlinear solid, the stress-strain relationship is a nonlinear function, and the slope of the stress-strain relation, E tangent, varies as a function of the strain. Most soft biological tissues are nonlinear like this. There is an upper limit to the load at which real materials will behave as elastic solids. In a ductile material, as the strain is increased, if it exceeds the elastic limit or yield point, it will start to deform plastically and eventually fail. The stress at which this catastrophic failure occurs is called the ultimate tensile stress. But even between the elastic limit and the failure point, the plastic deformations that occur during this phase of the loading are irreversible. They're not elastic. In a brittle material, the difference between the elastic limit load and the ultimate tensile load is very low. So very soon after the elastic limit is achieved, brittle materials will fail. Biological tissues frequently exhibit anelastic or non-elastic properties that are not associated with irreversible damage or failure. These include hysteresis, in which the stress-strain curve for loading is different from the stress-strain curve for unloading, and the area of this stress-strain loop represents the energy dissipated or lost during the loading and unloading cycle. In this test on coronary artery, we also see another common anelastic property of biological tissues, which is called preconditioning behavior, whereby the second cycle of loading to the same maximum stress and unloading is different from the first, and the third is different from the second. But eventually, with sufficient repetitions of the loading and unloading cycle, the stress strain loop becomes reproducible and is, the tissue is then said to be preconditioned. This is known as preconditioning behavior and is common in soft biological solids. Another common property of biological tissues that is not elastic is stress relaxation. When the strain is increased in the tissue and held constant over time, the stress increases instantaneously but then decays until it settles at a new lower value and this so-called stress relaxation is commonly seen in soft biological tissues. All of these properties, all of these properties, hysteresis, preconditioning, and stress relaxation, are displayed by materials that are known as viscoelastic materials. And we will find that viscoelasticity is a common and important property of soft tissues in biomechanics. So in biomechanics, we need to get used to moving between the theoretical engineering and modeling terminology and considerations with the practical experimental considerations in real tissues. So this table is just a brief introduction to some of the kinds of things that we think about in biomechanics and some of the kinds of experimental considerations that correspond with these theoretical and modeling considerations. For example, whether we consider a material to be linear or nonlinear, e.g. Hookean or non-Hookean, tends to depend in real life whether the tissue undergoes small or large strains. And this tends to be dependent on whether the tissue is hard or soft. Hard tissues like bone and teeth only undergo small strains and can be approximated as linear or Hookean elastic solids, whereas soft tissues tend to routinely undergo larger strains and exhibit non-linear, non-Hookean behaviors. Similarly, whether we can consider a material to be isotropic, having properties that are the same in all directions, or anisotropic with different properties in different directions, 
is strongly dependent on the specific microstructure and histology of the tissue, which is very different, for example, between skin, where the orientation of the connective tissue fibers tends to be very random, making the tissue fairly isotropic, versus muscle, which is very organized and fibrous, versus lung, which has a more isotropic structure. Similarly, whether we can regard a tissue as homogeneous, meaning the properties are the same everywhere, or non-homogeneous, meaning the properties differ from place to place, can be indicated by the morphology or architecture of the tissue. For example, bone has both cortical dense layers and trabecular layers, which have different structure and different properties. Blood vessel wall has different structure and different layers of the wall, and these have different mechanical properties. So I'd like you to go through this table, think about these different engineering ideas and experimental considerations as applied to different tissue types. Ask questions or make comments or suggest your own examples of these different properties and, and considerations. Post your questions and comments and your answers to other people's questions and comments online. Uh, we'll have a lot of discussion of these types of question so that we can learn more about how the wide range of different structures and functions of biological tissues translate into different engineering properties uh, and models and analyses. So to summarize the key points of this lecture, we reiterated that biomechanics is mechanics applied to biology and our specific focus is solid mechanics applied to physiology. We reviewed that continuum mechanics is based on the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy at a spatial scale where these quantities can be approximated as continuous function. We pointed out that biomechanics involves an interplay between experimental measurement in living tissues and theoretical analysis based on the physical foundations of mechanics. We saw that biomechanics has numerous applications in biomedical engineering, biophysics, medicine, and other fields. And that knowledge of the fundamental conservation laws of continuum mechanics is essential. We also discussed how the constitutive law describes the properties of a particular material, and therefore a major objective of biomechanics is identifying the constitutive law for biological cells and tissues and using it to better understand the relationship between structure and mechanical function in living systems.